and welcome back to the bookcast. I am D.L. White, Atlanta-based author of romantic fiction featuring black men and women, and we have been reading The Never List, my new release. It came out September 25th, so it's relatively still new, and um, we are actually nearing the end of this book, which I can't believe. Well, I can believe because I've been the one voicing it and editing it and uploading it. So yes, I actually can believe that. But um, we have made it almost all the way through this book. And the last episode was spicy, huh? Well, spicy for me. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but that was A, it was super cute and B, it was spicy. And so, but what happens now? What uh, What's going on with Trey and Esme? What's going on with Miller Design? What's going on with Pedigree Construction? Shall we find out? As a reminder, if you don't want to listen to these last four chapters, I'm going to record uh, 29 and 30 today, 31 in the epilogue um, uh, later on, which should air on Wednesday, and then we will be done with this book. Amazing, amazing, crazy. You can purchase this book in ebook or paperback. Just head to booksbydlwhite.com slash books. You can buy this book at any online retailer that you choose. If there's a retailer that you like to purchase at and you cannot find my book, please let me know. I will make every attempt to upload it there for sale. You can also buy this book in paperback at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Bookshop. I have seen that this book appears to be out of stock or unavailable. If you're able to go ahead and purchase it, do that. It's print on demand. So while they may be a little bit behind, they will catch up. If you order it, they will print it and send it to you. And so don't be swayed by that. A few people have asked, um, where do I earn the most if you if you buy it by paperback? The margins are so slim on paperback, it really doesn't matter. Buy it wherever you please. But if it's me, because I have Prime, I would buy it on Amazon because then you get free shipping. That's how you play that game. Otherwise, if you want to support your local indie bookshop, you can buy it at bookshop.org. Um, I would uh, love that. Um, you can also buy it at Barnes & Noble and other retailers where they sell paperback books. So there's that. Let's begin with uh, chapter 29 today. Let's go. Chapter 29. Trey. I fucking loved Esme. I fought the feeling, the very thought of it, because, bruh, what? But I had to be honest with myself. I wanted to be in love with her, so I gave up, gave in, and let myself sink into that warm feeling when I thought about a life with her. Potentially, because Esme was in love with me too, but getting her to say it? I had to remind myself of the first few weeks of knowing her. I would need to keep reminding myself that I was a patient man. Esme was not the type of woman to jump into forever based on fun dates and nice dinners. We were going to do the dance, play the game, wait to say those words to each other because it was so soon and it was so good that it couldn't possibly be real. But it was real. Very real. It was real when she woke up the next morning to my face between her legs while we ate breakfast and watched the local morning news and walked the beach looking for seashells, it was real. I happened to glance over at her while we waited at the marina for the sailboat that I chartered to find her eyes on me with that dreamy smile. I had to just decide that it was cool for us to know it because, in true Trey and Esme fashion, it wouldn't be a random moment when we said it. It had to be special. I was looking forward to that moment. This is probably the best vacation I've been on in years, I told Esme. She looked over at me, her curls blowing in the wind under a wide-brimmed straw hat. The pink and purple had washed out, so it was her natural, dark brown color. It's only day two, Trey. Yeah, and I'm saying it's already the best. Normally, I'm alone, or I drag Ken. He only wants to find a racquetball court or stalk restaurants or watch cooking shows, so I end up hanging out by myself in bars or sitting at the house. I always have to bring work so at least I can hear the ocean while I'm pounding away at reports. I waved a hand around the expanse of sand, the ocean waves, the marina, the restaurants and shops around us. This time, I didn't even bring my laptop, and I brought my girl, who I much prefer over Ken, by the way. Do you now? 
you don't snore, and you have a lot less back hair. Thanks, Dre. Thank you for that. I am having a good time with you, even though it's only day two. I leaned in close and waited for her to drop those lips on me. She grabbed my chin and pulled me to her so she could kiss me. I loved it when she did that. Same. My vacations have all been with people pissed that they had to drive because Esme won't fly, and pissed that they have to do boring shit because Esme doesn't like rides, and pissed that Esme won't get in the water if we go to the beach, and pissed that they can't go to a sushi restaurant because Esme won't eat that. I'm tired of holding myself and everyone else back from having the maximum amount of good time. Clearing my list has been so good for me. I feel that, I nodded. You've grown a lot in the last month. True. I could argue that it's because I found somebody amazing that I care about who cares about me. Care, huh? We care about each other. Yeah, she answered after a long, meaningful stare. A lot. We care a lot. Her eye caught the long vessel that moored into the marina. The driver cut the rumbling engine, leaving echoing sounds of water splashing against the hull of the boat. Wow, I hope that's ours. Think so. I stood, pulling her up with me. Let's go sailing, baby. We spent four glorious hours on the ocean and inlet cruise. The trip on the 39-foot yacht with eight other passengers included a light lunch and a wine flight except for Esme's thin, white sundress constantly catching the wind so that she had to clutch bits of it in her hand, and her beach hat flying off of her head, it was a perfect sail. We got off the boat slightly drunk, so we decided to grab ice cream cones and walk the beachside attractions. I got chocolate, Esme got strawberry cream, and we held hands while we wandered. You really didn't bring your computer. That seems like a big deal. It is. I never go anywhere without my work machine. Always something to do, some fire to put out, so it's weird to have nothing to do. Saul didn't fire you, did he? No. Not yet, anyway. Do you think he will? Nah. I licked my cone, trying to be a positive thinker, but the reality was that Pops very well could fire me. He can't admit when he's wrong, but his habit is to find a way to come around. I hope the last few days of writing Vincent on this revamped deal have shown him that I was right. Especially since Miller basically admitted to everything we suspected. Deeply in debt, hiding it, hoping you would sign the papers before you found it and were stuck. Right. It's best, in these situations, to... I swiped a hand in front of us. Get out of his face. All the way. No calls, no email, don't even be around. I heard that he was going to try to come to the office for a few days, so I took those days off. You don't feel like you're hiding? I shook my head. No. I know Pop's enough to know to stay out of his way. My sister... I halted, realizing that I was about to tell Esme about Missy, a woman I never talked about, had avoided talking about so much that I was putting off therapy because I'd have to talk about her. The only person I'd really confided in was Ken, and he was sworn to secrecy. That I was about to share something so sacred to me, and that I almost had no qualms about, that spoke volumes. Esme caught a drip of ice cream from the side of her cone with her tongue. I felt that in my groin. You don't have to talk about your sister, Trey. It's okay. I, uh, I don't mind, actually. Missy said something to me when I was at the house and Pops blew up. She said I needed to give him some time because he couldn't reason in a heightened state. Then she said something like, ask me how I know. Hmm. Her forehead wrinkled as she took another lick of her cone. What does that mean, you think? Missy has bipolar disorder. I glanced at Esme, looking for adverse reactions in her demeanor. My family history meant baggage and not anything I could easily unload. Esme seemed unbothered, deeply concentrating on finishing her cone before it melted. Uh. Anyway, she spent her teen years at an institution in Alabama. 
it was the best place to manage her lows and highs, but she didn't want to stay, so she checked herself out. She's inconsistent with her medication and therapy. She hates the way lithium makes her feel, so as soon as her mood stabilizes, she stops taking it. And then the cycle of trying to get her back on medication. I nodded, relieved that she understood. She is heavily dependent on my parents. They bought her a place. They pay her bills. I'm bending over backward, trying to please Pops and not bring him stress. Missy? Missy is all stress. My shoulders sagged with the heavy emotion that came over me when I thought about Missy. It was such a delicate situation. Pops thought that he could love and spoil the mental illness away when I thought Missy needed a stronger hand and to be more independent. What the hell did I know, though? I wasn't doing so well in the not-stressing-my-father-out department. Do you think she might be saying she's more like Saul than anyone knows? I pondered that, admitting to myself that it was something I hadn't wanted to think about. Maybe. This disorder can be hereditary. I'd like to talk to her more about it if we can have a conversation without fighting. She can't help the way she is, so it's up to me to change. I promised myself that when I got back to Atlanta, I'd see a therapist. I need to handle my relationship with her better than I have. That's because of you, you know. Me? We don't even talk about her. No, I mean that I want to start dealing with things that I hold in, stuff that holds me back. I want whole and healthy relationships. Someday I want to be a great husband, a great father. I don't want anything standing in the way of that. Hmm, Esme hummed, her expression thoughtful. I like hearing that. Yeah? Because no matter what, the goal is to be the best person possible, but it's dead sexy to want to be that so you can enrich someone else's life. I like that about you. Good answer. I let the silence between us hang like a weighted blanket. The surf, the sand, the crowds all added to the atmosphere. Esme could change the conversation if she wanted to, or forge ahead. Whichever way she wanted to go, I was game. And because, she added, after a few minutes, we've been dancing around this thing between us like it won't eventually lead to those discussions. Better answer. Do you think about that? With us? I didn't used to. Esme stopped walking and tossed the last bit of her cone in the nearby trash bin. My half-eaten cone followed. The local Myrtle Beach shops were nowhere near as good as Brewster's handmade ice cream. I moved to stand in front of her, tucked my finger under her chin, and tipped her head up to see her eyes. Didn't used to, I repeated. So you do now? Esme bobbed her head, side to side. The expression she wore was pained, tortured. That wasn't the reaction I expected or wanted. You don't want to talk about it? Not right now. Cool. Zero pressure, baby. I dropped an arm around her shoulder and guided her back to the parking lot. I could wait. It had only been a few days of sleeping next to Esme, but I was already so used to sharing a bed with her that I noticed when her spot was empty. I sat up, blinking to adjust to the pre-dawn darkness. Though I'd normally be wide awake at 5 a.m., the sea breeze had been so relaxing that I'd been sleeping in. Getting back on the peloton was going to be a struggle. I pulled on a pair of sweats and stumbled through the kitchen. The red light on the coffee pot was on. A shadow outside caught my eye. Esme was sitting in one of the deck chairs facing the surf, her hands wrapped around a coffee mug. Her silk robe fluttered in the breeze. I stepped out onto the deck barefoot. She watched me slide a chair over and sit next to her. Hey, girl. Hey. Did I wake you up? My body missed you. What's up? I was tossing and turning. I decided to get up. Two things Pettigrews are known for. A big nose that can smell what's for dinner, and big ears that are good for listening. She smiled, almost laughing. Okay, the nose thing is true, but I lied about the ears. 
you don't want to talk to me. I love talking to you. I just, I have feelings that I'm sorting through. You're up before the sun, sitting in the dark, staring at the ocean. It might help to talk. Is it about me? A little, she admitted, her tone husky. I heard her swallow, then go on. We've built this cocoon that we've been living in for five days. I have sex every day. I hang out with my guy who thinks I'm amazing. I eat good food. I drink good wine. Did I mention that I have sex every day? You mentioned that. Life's been good this week. So we go home today and I've been avoiding thinking about the real life that awaits me when I hit city limits. It's like I'm coming down from a crazy high and I have to deal with whatever the hell I did while I was freewheeling. She huffed a hard breath through her nose, shaking her head. I've been doing the most insane shit, things I would never do. I quit my job, Trey. I dyed my hair purple. I had sex with the man I met a month ago. When she put it that way, things did look a little wild, but wild is not a bad thing. None of that is bad, Esme, and I mean, I have a real life to get back to, too. But maybe we don't dismantle the cocoon when this vacation ends. We take everything we built during this time together and we keep it going. You're still with a guy that thinks you're amazing. We can still eat good food and drink wine and have sex. I'll help you look for a job. We'll make a new list of insane shit to do together. Trey, look, do you regret anything from the last month? Anything you wish you didn't do? Do you wish you never got on that Ferris wheel? Or dance with me on the roof? Did you want to stay at Benning? Didn't you love your purple hair? I wouldn't undo anything I've done, for sure. I just... I really thought that the balance of my life would be me living my best anti-existence. Maybe I could overcome my fear of flying enough to travel. I could stop being afraid of men enough to enjoy sex and have relationships. I thought my list would free me from that prison of fear so I could be different, I guess. She paused for a beat, her face turning toward mine before she lost her nerve and dropped her gaze to the mug in her lap. I reached over and tipped her chin back up with a finger. Your list did free you, Esme, and you are different. To what end, though? She coughed out a laugh. I mean... I met a man that makes me want nothing but to be his and only his. He wants to be a father. It never occurred to me that I don't even know if my body will do that when I'm ready. And even if it can, I've known him for a month. It is crazy to be thinking about planning for the future when I've only known a person for a month. Does the passage of time matter? Do you not feel what you feel no matter how long you felt it? What if I'm just caught up in someone new, and the magic fades, and the cocoon goes away, and we fizzle? What if I lose something that I really like having? What if I get the chance to have things that I told myself weren't for me, that I realize I've wanted my whole life? I'm terrified to want those things because what if I can't have them? As may, baby. I moved closer, wrapping my arms around her. How long have you been up torturing yourself with this? Who said you can't have it? You have never been here before, and that's okay. You're not alone. I'm not putting time stamps on us. If you want this, if you want me, I'm here. I just don't want to be selfish, she said, her voice not even a whisper. Not about you, not with your time and what you want. My feelings for you are so strong, Trey. So strong that I want to be fair to you. Having children after 40 is a risk, and I'm scared that maybe the mature choice would be to... No. I was a little louder, more forceful than I wanted to be, but that stream of consciousness could not continue. I wouldn't hear of Esme making sacrifices for what she thought I wanted. I'll stop you right there, because any scenario that doesn't have you in it is not better. It is not more mature. We are both young and healthy. We have time. We have options. We don't even know what the situation is yet. We could have twins by next Christmas, for all we know. Let's chill on worrying about things. And when we come to that bridge, we'll cross it together. 
I pulled her up with me as I stood. We're going home today, but right now we're still in the cocoon, so let's take advantage of these last few hours, okay? She seemed to breathe a little easier. At least she smiled when she walked past me. I grabbed her arm, though. Whoa, sexy, where are you going? In, in the house. You said, I didn't say we had to do that inside. She laughed, but I could hear the undercurrent of interest. Trey, out here? It's the middle of the night. So perfect. I pulled her to me, holding her body close to mine. It's me, you, and the ocean. A couple of seagulls, you mind if they watch? She tipped her face up to mine and smiled. In any light, as May was beautiful, but in the moonlight, the smooth landscape of her skin seemed as delicate as porcelain. I returned her smile, then pulled at the strings, tying her robe closed. The two sides fell open, revealing the red silk gown she'd put on after we showered together. I already detected two peaks poking out of the thin fabric. and made them stand at attention, grow firmer when I rubbed the backs of my hand against them. I stepped back, running my gaze from her head to her toes, admiring every delicious curve of her from the roundness of her breasts under the thin fabric to the flare of her hips to the point of her knees, even her white toenails that seemed to glow in the dark. Like what you see? More than anything I have ever seen before. As May rose up onto her toes, her mouth open and ready to meet mine in a passionate, breathy kiss, a moan curled from me as my body came to life. I moved, holding Esme by her hips and walking us back toward the railing that ran the length of the deck. We have to be a little quiet out here. Sound on the beach travels. Esme giggled. You spent four days saying louder, tell me louder, and now I have to be quiet? Not sure that I know how. Practice for when we're fucking while your cousin is home. She slapped a hand across her mouth to muffle a gust of laughter. My fingers were busy playing with the knee-length gown, pulling it up far enough to slip my hand underneath. As May wasn't wearing panties, she was slick and warm to the touch. Do you have any idea how sexy you are? Her lips tipped up in a wicked, seductive smile. You make me feel like the sexiest woman alive. Her eyes slid closed and her mouth dropped open when I slipped two fingers inside her, angling my thumb to run circles around her clit. It was like rolling a marble in oil. Ugh. She gripped my forearms and rocked against me. God, she gasped. Trey, that feels good. Making you feel good is my new favorite thing. Ah, uh, shh, I whispered, gripping the back of her neck. I found her mouth again while my fingers worked until she was bucking her hips. She hooked a finger into the band of my sweats, pulling them down my hips. My dick bobbed, growing harder in the sea air. What do you want? What do you want me to do? Fuck me, she hissed. Right here. Right now. Fuck me, Trey. I pulled my fingers from her, grabbed my dick, and smeared her juices across the head. She turned around, placed both hands on the railing in front of her, and looked back at me, her bottom lip wedged between her teeth. God damn. I don't see how I can say no. I moved behind her, flipping up her robe and gown to take in the generous roundness before I guided myself into her. I reached around to palm a breast, gripping and kneading, flicking a nipple. I pumped my hips against her my mouth buried in her neck to muffle the noises that I couldn't stop if I wanted to. She pushed back against me, then reached for the hand that had her by the waist and moved it to her clit. I stroked, enjoying her warmth moving against me. Have I mentioned that I love this pussy? Esme moaned, long and low. Is this pussy mine, Esme? I hissed into her ear. You saved this just for me, huh? Is it mine? Take it! Take it, it's yours! The slap of skin on skin, alongside the hushed tones of two people in the throes of ecstasy, trying not to make noise, was erotic to me. Like an open secret between us, the ocean waves adding background music to our symphony. The pre-orgasmic trembles rocked Esme a few moments before she squealed my name and ground her ass against me. Her pussy clenched violently, pulsing and squeezing. I thrust harder faster to try to come with her. Finally, my orgasm crashed through and I tossed my head back, 
gripping her hips and clenching my teeth to grunt a muted fuck into the air. Breaths heavy, hands shaking, she broke from my grip and turned around. Then she placed her hands on my chest and pushed us back to the chairs we'd just abandoned. I backed up until my legs hit the wood slats and dropped into the seat. Esme wasted no time in lowering herself onto me. She rolled her hips and pulsed her pussy walls to pull me further inside. I gripped two handfuls of her and held on, alternately drawing one, then the other nipple into my mouth while she rode me. You feel so fucking good, Trey. How how do you feel so good? Babe, shh. I can't. She tossed her head back and laughed into the night air. Fuck, I love your dick. I laughed. Ez, I don't care. This feels too good. I dug my fingers into her ass and spread my legs, scooting up in the chair so that I had some leverage to match her thrusts. The chair began to thump against the side of the house since we had worked our way across the deck. Come for me, baby. She giggled. Now you want me to be quiet. You don't care about the neighbors? I don't care either. I want to come, though, waiting on you. Okay. I'm gonna... I'm... She bit down on her lip, her face a study in concentration. Her body moved like a piston, her breaths beginning to match the rhythm. A gut-level grunt ripped from her throat. I felt her thighs tense, her back arch, and her inner walls pulse with an intense climax, which took me over the edge. Fuck, I'm coming! Me too. I released a burst of air, my release coming swiftly and bringing immeasurable relief. We spent a few minutes catching our breaths. I glanced around at the homes on either side of us. No lights came on, no curious onlookers passed by. You, Esme panted, deliriously giggling and lightly slapping a palm on my chest. Me? Nah, baby, you jumped me. No, I mean, you are some kind of man, Mr. Pettigrew. I can't believe I waited so long to have sex, but I'm kind of happy I waited so long to have sex. Worth waiting for? She hummed happy sounds, sounds of pure pleasure as she wrapped her arms around me, her lips finding mine for a deep, passionate kiss. So worth it. When she stood, I did too, and pulled my sweatpants up. We went back to the bedroom where I pulled the robe from her shoulders, lifted the silky red gown from her body, dropped my sweatpants where I stood, and took Esme back to bed. We still had hours before our afternoon flight. I wanted to spend as much of that time as possible making slow, sweet love to her. Chapter 3 Trey Well, well, well. Do my eyes behold the ghost of Trey Pettigrew at midnight racquetball? I didn't even turn around so Ken could get the benefit of my sheepish grin. I bounced the rubber ball against the wall while I waited for him to get his petty gloating and ribbing out of the way. I mean, it couldn't be the actual likeness of Trey Pettigrew. I haven't seen him since he busted into my restaurant and demanded that I make a sushi dish that is not actually sushi. He doesn't answer the phone. He doesn't return texts. It's not like we live in the same building or anything. All right, all right, all right. I turned around, both arms extended, a racket in one hand, a rubber ball in the other. I am sorry. I didn't mean to ghost you. You're still my dude, jealous fool. I've been crazy busy. Is it Esme? I'll forgive you if it's Esme. Man. I gestured at him to serve. He did, sending the ball into the wall for me to send it back. It's work. It's the house. It's Esme. It's a lot. I haven't been sitting at home staring at the wall. Far from it. At Pettigrew, I managed a full portfolio of projects, grinding to stay on Pop's good side and be available to Vincent while he stepped up to run Pettigrew. I didn't feel nearly as left out and dejected as I thought I would feel, knowing that I wasn't at the helm anymore. I honestly felt relieved, but still pensive. If I was going to spend the next 10 to 15 years being an underling, an executive underling, but an underling nonetheless, then I was going to have to make my move to run my own show. If I wasn't in the office or at a Pettigrew site, I was micromanaging my house build. I wanted major construction to be complete 
finishing up interior details by December. The walls were up, concrete had been poured, wire pulled, fixtures were going up, and the flooring and other materials had arrived. Ideally, I could wake up in my own house on Christmas Day if I had my bedroom, the kitchen, bathroom, and at least one room downstairs walled, floored, and powered. I'd put up my condo for sale, and Esme and I had started packing. I spent the balance of my time with Esme. The cocoon that we'd built up over our vacation kept us solid. We preferred to stay in our cloud of newfound, giddy love. Good food, good wine, good sex, made easier since she didn't have to go to work. Job hunting was going well, though. Her assumption that her MBA would let her play well in the market was correct. The response to her resume and years of experience with Benning netted calls and emails immediately. In fact, she had an early interview in the morning, so we'd had some dinner, some wine, some sex, watched a show, and then I cut out early so she could get to bed and be well-rested. But I couldn't sleep because sex with Esme didn't relax me. It wound me up. I'd become used to sharing a bed with her, coming down from the highs of orgasm together. When I got home, I texted Ken, though I had been ignoring him for weeks. I'd miss being close enough to get in a quick game. If I wasn't going to be having sex on the deck of a beachfront home in the middle of the night, I'd settle for getting my ass beat. So, the last I heard, the bid was toast. Are you still playing CEO? Nah, I answered, returning a weak serve. I gave him a look and slammed it back at him. He had to run to catch it and send it back. Vincent is acting CEO, and I'm actually happy about that. He and Pops have been running the company for 30 years. They finish each other's sentences. I should have known better than to think I could do it. If I remember right, you did know better, and you told him that you knew better, but he insisted on giving you the job. You know how it goes when I tried to have those I-told-you-so conversations with Pops. You have to let it play out. The good news, though, is that he's not furious about the bid anymore, especially since they got to submit anyway. I'm holding out for that promise he made me. Pops has been fighting you on residential for a while. Think it'll pan out? It would be a great way for him to say he's sorry for not trusting me. We would have lost our asses if I'd signed that contract. Now he feels like he's doing something good by acting as a mentor, bringing a young pipsqueak up into the world. My eyes rolled involuntarily. Miller is smart, but he's also a smarmy, sneaky motherfucker. The shit I've given up that Esme gave up behind his shady ass? I seethed, slamming my anger into the ball. It bounced off of the wall and came flying back, but Ken couldn't run fast enough to catch it. He's a work that guy. I have more insulting words for him. I don't like him, and I'm glad we don't have to absorb him into Pettigrew. Heads up, Ken served. We slammed the ball around the room for a half hour of rowdy play before taking a break to hydrate and breathe. Ken paced, sucking down water from a sports bottle. I did the same, but sank to the floor with my back against the pane of glass. So you're not going to spill any juice about Esme? I thought the smile that always wanted to pop up whenever anyone brought her up. Vincent had become insanely curious about her ever since she spent the afternoon at Pettigrew and risked her job to save our asses. Now he was asking after her too. How was she doing? Did she find a job yet? I got it. She was beautiful, engaging, assertive, but also warm, sweet, sensuous woman. A person got a very good idea of what they were getting from her by spending a little time with her. I was obsessed with her, too. What kind of juice are you looking for? The usual, man. Maybe you're rusty on the rules. In this friendship, we talk about the women we date. You tell me you like her. I tell you that you're an idiot. You tell me all the simp shit you do for her. I tell you that you're whipped. Ken paused for a moment, then grinned. And then I go back to my place pick up my phone and hop back on Tinder because I'm jealous of what you have. He stood over me, offering a hand to pull me up. Let's grab a basement beer before the bar closes down. Basement beer was what we called getting a drink at the bar in the basement of the building. We often slid in just before a last call, considering that it could be the last basement beer I'd have with Ken. I let him pull me up, then followed him around the corner to the bar. A few minutes later, we were posted up with frosty bottles, and a bowl of salt and vinegar corn nuts, our usual basement beer combo. You seem different this time, man. I mean it. I shook my head, my mouth in a downturn. I'm no different. Same soup, just reheated. 
If that's the case, your woman is heating things up in a whole different way. Did you take her to your spot in Myrtle Beach? How did that go? It was nice. I bobbed my head, smiling at the memory of five long, blissful days with Esme. Late nights on the deck, listening to music, playing spades or uno. Early mornings in the bed with her, starting the day off right. Sunset walks on the beach, hand in hand, while we just talked, laughed, played. Easy. It had never been so easy. It was great to get out of the city, get some alone time with her, you know, spend some quality time together, figure out who we are outside of all this work stress and family stuff. I bet. By quality time, you mean, come on, man. I've never been that dude. That's all you. I was never the type to kiss and tell. I never had much to tell. Now I had something I wanted to tell the world, but it was precious to me. I couldn't see sharing what was intimate and meaningful between us for Ken's amusement. Besides, Ken's worldwide exploits were infamous. Funny, because he always claimed to be jealous of the few more serious relationships I'd had. You're no fun anymore, Trey. You're not giving me anything? I'll give you something, I said, leaning forward. I tipped my beer to my lips and took a long, fortifying swallow, then set the half-empty bottle back onto the bar. This woman, Esme, she's changed my life. My whole world, my whole outlook on life in, like, six weeks. I can't remember what life was like before I met her. I don't want to think about going back to being without her. I love her. I'm in love with her. Damn, Ken whistled pretending to white sweat from his brow. It's heavy. Does she know? Does she feel the same? Hell yeah, she knows. And she feels the same. So I really am catering your wedding? Man, keep the calendar open, you know what I'm saying? We laughed together, then I picked up my beer again, and before I took another sip, said, I mean, I haven't said the L word to her yet, and she hasn't said anything to me yet. So how do you know she knows how you feel, and how do you know she feels the same? I shrugged. I know. Mark my words. Until then, I'm playing it cool, being there, loving her, enjoying being in her world. It's a nice place to be. I guess I can only hope to find the same sometime. You'd have to sit your ass down somewhere first. Actually... Ken's tongue flicked out to moisten his bottom lip as his gaze dropped to the table, his skin gaining a pinkish tone. I met this woman the last time I was in New York. Remember, I went up there to scout restaurant locations a few months ago? I remember. She lives there? Yeah, a waitress at the restaurant in the hotel I stayed at. I came in right before closing. Force of habit, I guess? He chuckled, flashing me a shy half-smile. I talked her into letting me sit down, said I'd take whatever they had left that was prepared, and I took her well. She said she was saving something, and if I wanted it, I could have it. Turned out she'd ordered dinner and was going to take it home. I felt bad about taking her dinner from her, but she said she'd rather have her money, so I paid her double for it. Then I shared it with her. See, you talk about the simp shit I do, you sap. Anyway, we ended up sitting in the closed bar, talking and eating cold lasagna till like, I don't know, 4 a.m.? I've eaten frozen lasagna that tasted better, but she... She was nice. I got her number. We talk here and there. I'm, uh... Ken sat up, then smoothed his palms down well-muscled thighs. Thinking about taking a trip up there, you know, long weekend, some time to relax. Maybe run into her. He looked up at me and caught my eye. Or whatever. You should probably make plans to see her and spend time with her like an adult, you moron. What, you're the oracle now? I'm in love with the woman that can't get enough of me. My advice is probably better than just showing up and expecting her to drop her life for you. Even if you're Ken Takagi, owner of Eito Worldwide, nobody gives a shit about your social status if you're a dick. He nodded his head. Maybe you're right. I know I am. Another piece of advice and then I'm taking my ass to bed. 5 a.m. comes early. I stood and stretched my already tight limbs. Naked condoms. Buy a lot of them. They're pricey, but worth it. You, uh... He pointed at me. You two used them? We did. We both tested clear for STDs, and Esme is almost 40 and on the pill. 
at this point, if she gets pregnant, it's meant to be. I'll be happy as shit. You as a dad? Now that's a weird thought. Ken stood, drained his beard, then dug into his pocket for his wallet. He left a few dollars on the table. I added to it, and we walked together toward the elevator. For what it's worth, I'm glad you met somebody. I really hope it works out for you, too. And I'm watching. It's long past time for us both to grow up, you know? Thanks for coming in, son. Good to see you. Sure, Pops. Surprised to see you in the office. I was still recovering from the shock of walking into Pettigrew at my normal time at 7 a.m., a cup from brew bar in hand and the residue of Esme's lip balm on my lips, to find Pops in his office. He wore a dark tailored suit, collared shirt, and tie with pocket square, even shiny wingtips like he hadn't been out of the office for months. His physique showed it, though. His eyes were bright, but the lids were hooded. He'd lost some hair, and he'd slimmed considerably, making him appear even taller, more foreboding. He perched in a tall leather chair, rolling it up to his desk, the surface of which had been clean for months. We hadn't used his office, and his executive assistant made it a point to keep it dust-free. An 8 a.m. meeting popped up on my calendar as soon as I settled in at my desk. I had been summoned to Pop's office. You won't see me here often, said Pops, but I am trying to get out of the house, ease back into business. It's no longer relaxing to sit at home and let other people run my company. I'm under strict orders to be home no later than five o'clock. I let my deep nod show my understanding. My mother was not a tall woman, but her personality was a beast, and she was not to be ignored. Pops would vacate the premises at the agreed-upon time, or else. Anyway, Vincent is still in control, so I plan to have an easy day, check up on progress, get a feel for how the business has changed since I was gone. I'd like to run down the current projects, discuss the forecast for next quarter, and project into the first quarter of next year. A baseline, just to get your thoughts. I was not ready for this conversation. I had the information in my head, of course. It was my job to know these numbers forward and backward for such a time as this. But this would mark the first time that Potts had called me into his office and asked me such detailed questions about the business, listened to my thoughts and assumptions, and offered opinions without starting a sentence with, see, that's why you're here to learn. I didn't feel like a pup anymore. After a few minutes of polite back-and-forth business speak, Pops leaned back in his chair and folded his arms across the belly he had left. Who do you think about carving out time next year, maybe first or second quarter, to float a pilot of your division? I'm thinking about that space on the second floor in the southeast corner. It's got room for about four people to have a dedicated workspace. You don't need more than that to get started, do you? I sat up, unsure that I'd heard what I'd heard. I wanted to be dramatic and pretend to clean my ears or turn my head toward him and ask him to repeat himself, but Pops wouldn't find that funny. Vincent would, though. Um, sir? Vincent has convinced me that this would be a great move for you. He thinks you've earned the opportunity and his respect. I'm inclined to give you both the benefit of the doubt. I expect you to stay up on your current workload until this new division begins to demand more of your time. We aren't going through the effort to replace you, then shuffle people around if it doesn't plan out. Understood, sir. I appreciate this opportunity. I want to say that I won't let you down, but... I let the long pause float in the air between us. You've never been a disappointment to me a day in your life, Trey, said Pops. You're a hard worker with a sharp mind. Your business sense is impeccable, and I was wrong to question it. You got it from me, after all. I wanted to roll my eyes. The fight to resist was valiant, and I won. The house you designed? I took another look at the plans you showed me a few years ago. He gave me a solitary nod. That was a lot coming from him. I understand that you're building now? I nodded, swallowing hard. I hadn't shared any house-building updates with him. I didn't want him to disregard them like I was a petulant teen who thought I could be a Grammy-winning rapper. I had knowledge, skills, and a goal. It wasn't a silly pursuit, and I wouldn't give him another chance to push it down. It's almost up, actually. I'm hoping to be in it by Christmas. Mmm. 
I'm anxious to see how nice it looks in real time, Halls. He shrugged, opening his hands to show his palms. You know, construction. I shifted, feeling myself grow more at ease in this room, in the shadow of my father. I felt more like we were colleagues, not father and son. It was gratifying. Also terrifying, but I was ignoring that feeling. It's honestly about the same. Writing rough on the project manager, having somebody out on site running the show, keeping the budget in line, watching it come together is still like magic. It's very much artistic. You know what I mean? Mmm, he hummed, stroking his beard in the same way that I did. I do. I cried at the first finished Pettigrew build. See, I might cry when my house is done. I'm not going to feel bad about that now. We laughed together, a pitter-patter of polite chuckles. How's the lady? he asked quietly. I hadn't brought up Esme either, since she played a part in the contract negotiations flying off the rails, though I shouldn't have been surprised that he was asking about her. Esme, a smile broke out. Though I wanted to remain professional, her name on my lips made me happy. Esme is great. Is she working again? She had a great interview yesterday at a spot she really wants to jump to. They called her back already and offered her the job. Almost twice what she was making at the old spot, so... Yeah, actually. Good. He tapped the desk and gave a resolute nod. I hadn't realized he was so invested. I'd like to meet her, so would your mother. More than you realized, probably. I'm sure you'll get the chance soon. Oh? It's serious? Yes, I admitted. It's serious. I'm in love with her. Well, why don't you bring her by this weekend? Your mother hasn't had a chance to show out in the kitchen in a while. Ah, uh, it's her birthday weekend. I've got something special planned, but maybe we'll swing through. Excellent. Pop smiled. Not a fake business smile, but the kind of smile a man has for his son. Let us know, and tell her that I said happy birthday. He tipped his chair forward again and reached for his laptop to flip the cover open. That was his usual sign that the conversation was over. You'll report to Vincent, of course, on the residential business. I'd like you to set up some time to discuss the launch and go down to the second floor to scope out the area. That's all the space you're getting for right now. Make it work. Yes, sir. I'll do that. I hopped up from my seat like I'd been electrocuted and shot for the door. I wanted to get out of Pop's office before he changed his mind. I still had to make plans for Esme's birthday, and we had one last adventure to complete. Thank you so much for joining me for episode 11 of the bookcast, Rereading the Never List. Again, you can purchase this book at books by dlwhite.com slash books in ebook at any of the online platforms or paperback. Uh, I've seen it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and bookshop.org. Basically, if you can buy a paperback online, you should be able to find it there. Um, all else fails, run on over to Amazon and order it for free shipping on Prime. That's what I would do. So we have basically one more episode of the book cast. Um, ba well, the episodes on the Never List left. And I want to let you know that I'm going to be taking a little bit of a break while I write my holiday short. It's called Still I Rise. We'll be going back to Potter Lake for this short. And I'm super excited because I have missed Leslie and KC and Sage and Bennett. Um, this one's going to be um, fun. I, well, I plan to have fun writing it. And I'm also going to be recording that for the bookcast. And so my hope is to have it uh, written, edited, um, ready to release, and then record episodes of the bookcast and have those air as the book goes on sale. Of course, life is what happens while you're making plans. So we'll see how that plan works out. But um, that's my goal. And so I'll be taking a little break, but I'll be back in late November, early December with Still I Rise. Very excited about that. So until then, please take care of yourselves and have a great day.